Good morning to all. My name is Daniel Wolf. I'm the director of the Harm Reduction Program at the Open Society Foundations, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this uh, session. Uh, we heard yesterday in the opening ceremony that the theme of the conference is leadership. And of course, one extremely important part of leadership or expression of leadership is how much money people are willing to put toward the cause that they believe in. And that is the subject of our discussion here this morning. Um, this is not a PowerPoint presentation driven session. It is a moderated informal conversation. Uh, we have a distinguished panel representing various viewpoints. Um, I'm not going to read the full biographies of all the participants, but let me just give you a brief summary of some of their most important accomplishments. To my immediate left is uh, Dr. Shari. He is the Deputy Director of Disease Control and the head of the AIDS response in Malaysia on behalf of the Ministry of Health, and he's also the Executive Secretary of the, community, of the Country Coordinating Mechanism, which engages with the Global Fund. Um, so we'll be asking him to speak uh, from both perspectives. Um, to his left is Marika Vindroks. She is the Chief of Staff at the Global Fund. Many of us uh, have known her in her other incarnations. Um, because she has also been uh, a representative of the Dutch government, working on uh, various issues. She was the ambassador for HIV AIDS and sexual and reproductive health and rights and the deputy director of the social development department. Uh, to her left, Lambert Reins, and he is the uh, current uh, director of the social development department and special ambassador for sexual and reproductive health and rights and HIV AIDS, so I assume he and Marika um, have much to discuss in their current roles, uh, and uh, I assume that speaks to one reason why the Dutch government has been such an important collaborator uh, with the Global Fund. And finally, to Lambert's left is Pascal Tange. He uh, has been, he was for many years, um, uh, the lead representative for the, the re that part of the Global Fund grant in Thailand that was responsible for implementing HIV prevention for injecting drug users. That program was called the Champion IDU, and he is currently the board, a board member of the Ozone Foundation, which is the current implementer of HIV prevention activities for people who inject drugs in Thailand. So we have a range of perspectives represented, and I guess uh, I want to start with the obvious, which is that um, many of us in the room are worried that there is less money for harm reduction at precisely a time, and as we saw yesterday, and as we'll hear, we need to be scaling up. So I want to ask each of you to briefly just answer the question, what are you personally doing to ensure scale up of funding for harm reduction? And if, uh, with apologies, because we want to leave time for questions, try to keep your answers relatively brief so that we can have some exchange with the audience. So Dr. Shari, uh, you're on the hot seat first. Thank you, thank you, Chair. And panelists, ladies and gentlemen, Regarding uh, these countries, before I embark on this uh, program of harm reduction, bear in mind that the, the first step of the country is try to tackle our response to this epidemic start, was started in 1985 with various approach through the providing education, providing services through contact tracing, notification, surveillance, treatment, and uh, so on. There are tremendous numbers of initiatives being done covering primary, secondary, tertiary prevention in this country. And uh, for the Harm Reduction Program, uh, it was started in the uh, uh, year 2005. And bear in mind that in this country, we, we believe on the three Ps. Number one is political will. Number two is a policies, workable policy. And the number three is a participation. We start from the first P. But the political will, not only here we will try to drive the way we try to do, but the political will also try to ensure adequate funding for the, our prevention. That's why through the political will, the government endorsed the way that we try to do about harm reduction since on that particular time, 70% of our cases are among the people who use drugs. That's why we start to have the exchange program together with harm, together with method and maintenance therapy. And that particular time, government didn't think of external funding. We start thinking of how the way the government should do in addressing this issue through our domestic funding. That's why in that particular time, the government already uh, made a, a, a policy that methadone program, the government will purchase 
the metadata through our existing facility. And the government also will purchase needle exchange program. The, 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 the whatever brand uh, that, that the, the person who used that need that kind. And then we fund that, uh, so the, 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 we fund that money through the Malaysian Arts Council. And at the same time, government believes that. Government cannot work in silo. They have to work with the Malaysian Arts Council as one of the umbrella body or non-government organization. And government make a commitment to fund the Malaysian Arts Council and their partner organization to implement that program. Is that an actual dollar commitment or is, is a general it, commitment? It's an actual dollar commitment. For the methadone program, government pumped 14 million ringgit. Until today, we haven't not finished yet the 14 million ringgit annually. And for the needles program, government pumped 5 million ringgit to purchase needle and switch. On top of that, also, uh, we complement 1 million, 1.5 million for condom. <coughs> and at the same time, we are making a commitment around 6 to 7 million ringgit or so to fund the non-government uh, the, the non organization, Malaysian Health Council. This is the way that we are committed to do so. Thank you. So let me turn to Marika. Um, this is exactly what the Global Fund is often saying they want governments to do. And at the same time, we know that not all governments are the Malaysian government. And I personally visit many government officials who will say privately, I have no intention of paying for needle and syringes. Let the Global Fund do that. So what is the Global Fund, what are you, how are you thinking about funding scale up in this complicated dynamic? Thank you, Danielle. Um, just as a starting point, I think we all agree that the funding situation, the funding gap for harm reduction is really quite dramatic. And, uh, and the donor landscape is actually becoming smaller rather than larger. And um, so we just discussed before going to the, the, the stage that it's now basically the Netherlands and there's not so many other bilateral donors left that's or the US that, that really fund harm reduction programs. And so the Global Fund from the start has been an advocate for evidence-based interventions including harm reduction and we are, are still the single largest donor funding harm reduction programs. Up to 2014, we spent 620 million uh, on harm reduction programs uh, of people, in fact, um, <coughs> programs targeting people inject drugs uh, more broadly in 58 countries and we are now in the middle of our current replenishment cycle and tracking how funding is going and at least at the moment there's no indication that that would decline and, uh, and we hope there will be actually further increases because one of the, this is the first time in a strategy that we have an explicit object objective on human rights so there's a greater focus on human rights and key populations. And our board is in the middle of discussing the strategy 2017-2020. Uh, and if one thing, there will be even greater focus on human rights. So I think policy-wise, um, we're in, in, in a good spot. Um, so what we do to encourage investment in harm reduction, especially in some uh, of the, the middle-income countries that will gradually have to take over a greater part of financing, is for example the uh, team for Eastern Europe and Central America, uh, Central, Central Asia. Um, they developed a guidance note to track investment and to guide countries on how to, to, to apply for global fund funding. And that is very much focused on uh, key populations and, uh, and all efforts that support programs targeting key populations. And the team is tracking whether the concept notes that come in actually do that. And, and so far, there's 100% compliance. It's quite strict guidance, I have to say. Um, so what we do for the upper middle income countries um, is that there's now very strict guidance that all support that the Global Fund provides targets key populations. And we assume that countries take on like the general programs, the treatment, the, the general programs. So that's, we really do not see a role for the Global Fund in funding that in upper middle income countries. And while not all donors on the board are very comfortable with the Global Fund engagement in upper middle income countries, as long as the focus is strictly on key populations, they're okay because they see there's value added. And, um, <coughs> key populations would not have access if it wouldn't be for the global fund in many countries. So I think moving forward we can, can maintain that focus. Um, when it comes to the overall funding situation, of course we have to uh, take into account that the overall environment is not very positive. So we will be having our next replenishment in 2016 and um, in an environment where there's many competing comp uh, competing priorities. We have the climate conference next week in Paris. We have an SAG agenda that's much broader. 
and um, an unprecedented refugee crisis affecting Europe. So uh, we really will do our very best to um, go for a good replenishment, a good outcome. But I think it's also to be realistic. The environment is not a very positive one at the moment. So let me turn to Lambert. Um, as Marika mentioned, if we were having this conversation 10 years ago and we invited donors present to up to the podium, we would have had DFID, OSAID, I mean, obviously there's no longer any OSAID, but uh, uh, we would have had many more countries and now we are very grateful to have you, but uh, curious and concerned that, um, that the idea that middle income countries should take care of their own is a, is a kind of theory of overseas development assistance that seems to focus more on <coughs> gross national income than on inequality within countries. And for those of us who work with drug users, uh, you know, people who inject drugs are often in richer countries but still aren't getting any services from the government. How is the Dutch government thinking about this question of investment in middle income countries? And same to you as to all the other panelists, uh, how are you ensuring that funding for harm reduction grows rather than shrinks? Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel. <clears throat> let, me, let me start by, by congratulating the Malaysian government for their tremendous achievements over the last couple of years, a uh, decrease of HIV incidence uh, of by 50% over the last nine years, which is mainly due to their investments in harm reduction. Um, which for me is a perfect example of what a government can do. You spoke about political will um, and the responsibility a government should take. And that's exactly also the answer to your question, I think. Why, if you want to really scale up and if you really want to make a difference as a government, you have to take responsibility. Um, now, let me first uh, look at the, at the broader picture, because worldwide, the picture is not as positive as in Malaysia. Um, HIV incidence uh, worldwide amongst people who inject drugs has, is decreasing only very, very slowly. Uh, in, one, in the year 2010, we were, uh, there was an HIV incidence amongst people who inject drugs of about uh, 110,000 people, and it slowly decreased to about 100,000 people, it's, which is only 10% um, a decrease in, uh, in about three years. Um, and if you look at the countries which introduced harm reduction policies, it's a little bit over half of the countries which have documented um, injection drug use. So 90 countries worldwide, more or less, with uh, OST programs. In a way, it's encouraging. On the other hand, it is way too, too, too little. Now, <clears throat> um, and yes, you're right, there are only a few international donors, such as Global Fund, and very few bilateral donors, such as the Netherlands, which are willing to provide support on harm reduction. Uh, unfortunately, the Netherlands is one of the very few uh, donors, it used to be a bit more. Um, but even we think that in the end, um, governments uh, should take their responsibility. So uh, uh, domestic resource, domestic revenue funding, domestic resource mobilization should indeed be uh, our, our, our key uh, focus. Having said that, what can we do as a, as a bilateral donor? Uh, maybe I can give you a few examples of what we um, have been doing and what we are going to do in the next couple of years. We just, uh, just last month, uh, introduced uh, a new uh, extension of a program which we are funding. It's called Bridging the Gaps, uh, working through Dutch and international and local NGOs, um, focusing on, on service delivery to a couple of countries. Um, <clears throat> on top of that, very interesting, we uh, are going to uh, start next year with a program which is a huge program which is focusing on strengthening the capacity of local NGOs to lobby and advocacy. So to hold their own governments accountable um, and remind those governments of the political will. Um, so that's not directly focusing on the governments but on civil society so that civil society can help um, well, improve conditions uh, in their own country with government funding. Um, another example is a strategic partnership which we have with the International HIV AIDS uh, Alliance, which is still to be negotiated, actually. Um, we do have a very interesting trilateral cooperation with UNAIDS, 
with uh, NGOs working under the Bridging the Gaps program, Dutch and local NGOs, and our embassies, as well as local governments in three countries, in Indonesia, uh, Kenya, and <coughs> Ukraine, where we basically try to uh, support better cooperation amongst key populations. Um, and finally, one thing which you know, but uh, we will have, we will host in the year 2018 in Amsterdam, the International AIDS Conference. Uh, last year, Melbourne, next year, Durban, and in 2018 in Amsterdam. And Amsterdam will be very much focusing on, on key populations, including harm reduction. Now, that does not, not give an answer to your question why only the Netherlands is left uh, amongst those donors, but um, probably it, uh, it, it gives some inspiration and ideas to other donors to, uh, to step in and uh, help us uh, with this endeavor. Okay, thank you. And I want to uh, maybe turn up the heat a little bit, because this in some, and I do want to recognize the incredible leadership of all of you. Um, and I also want to say that these questions of governments taking over and transition are not as simple as they sound. There are numerous instances where governments say they're going to take over, the donor leaves and indeed nothing is taken over. I'm thinking for example of Serbia, I'm thinking of Romania, I'm thinking of a number of countries where the exit of international donors meant the collapse of harm reduction programs. Um, and then there are countries where the transition is underway, where the government says it will take over sometime soon and we have signs that things are not, all is not well. And I actually wanted to ask Pascal, because you sit in a so-called transition country, um, moving from global fund supports for harm reduction to national support for HIV programming. And I guess the question is, how is it going? And what do you wish people like, or entities like bilateral donors of the global fund understood more clearly? Thank you, Daniel. Um, I think the first thing that's important to understand about Thailand is that the Thai government made the decision in late in 2014 to fully finance the national HIV response as of 1st of January 2017. Obviously there was not a lot of money coming to Thailand in the new funding model, so the Thai government, with support from civil society, decided to use the new funding model as a transition period. Uh, the, Actual implementation of that transition was never discussed and outlined in detail, but there was support, even from civil society, to move towards a fully nationally financed national HIV response. However, since the beginning of that transition, since the beginning of the new funding model, there's been a lot of challenges. We had a large project called Champion IDU that was operating for five and a half years that reached approximately 50% of the total injecting drug user population in Thailand. All the services, all the components have been scaled down. So we work in fewer provinces. We no longer work in pr prisons. We had this private public partnership with private sector pharmacies to distribute in needle and syringes and other equipment that's been cut out. A lot of the support systems and a lot of the support systems have been cut out to protect our staff from undue abuse from law enforcement in the field, as well as the funding for advocacy has been now centralized under one subrecipient. So our organization no longer has the capacity to directly advocate for our own population. These have led to many complications in the field, and we're essentially, to kind of answer the same question that is, has been asked from every other panelist, what we've been doing is trying very hard to protect the successes that were there in 2014. Unfortunately, we've not been able to do that, but we have identified a lot of the risks way back in 2013 and initiated discussions with the Global Fund, at least communication with the Global Fund and Global Fund representatives working on Thailand issues. Fortunately, after more than 25 communications with Global Fund representatives, we still haven't even had a chance to sit down and dialogue and look at those risks ex explicitly and come up with a plan to address those risks properly. So I want to go to Dr. Shari and then I'll come to Marika, but obviously, and this is not meant to be a forum on a particular country, but, and more about the sort of dynamics of transition. Mm -hmm but you are also undergoing a transition. You receive global fund support. You will never receive it again. Um, what, are you, <laughs> what are you doing to plan for the transition? And I mean, it's a different situation to Thailand because as we have already heard, you invested from the start 
Um, but I'm, I'm still curious, how are you thinking about uh, making sure that the transition doesn't result in the kinds of service disruptions we just heard about? Thank you, Dana. And uh, regarding the international donor, especially from the Global Fund and also you have received also from International Alliance, uh, actually from the beginning, the government didn't think of external funding. We are uh, keep thinking on domestic funding, try to solve the because to be the responsible government, they must understand what's the needs of the people. That's why we are looking that way. And uh, we are very fortunate the, the Global Fund and International Alliance did uh, extend their arm to us since 2010 and 11. And thanks for these uh, two organizations that uh, allow us to extend uh, in such a way, in that speed, to reach uh, almost 85% of people who use drugs through the Humble Action Program. And uh, for your information, the domestic funding divided into two. One is a domestic public and the other one is domestic private. Domestic public pro come about 95% of our, our budget for, for last year. And for your information, in 2013 and 2014, there is uh, 10 million different of the domestic public by the government. Means the government top up in 10 million from 2013 to 2014. Increase. Increase. And uh, domestic private almost maintained at the level of 2 million. Mm. And for international funding, international alliance and uh, global fund did contribute around 4% to 5% of our uh, uh, funding to the HIV and it works. It works. And from the beginning, once the government agreed to receive those funding, we uh, keep thinking that the funding should be for the non-government organization rather than from the government. That's why we channel all those money to the non-government organization for them to extend in that speed to reach all those people, the community. And uh, we are also ne uh, negotiating with the, the Global Fund the last two weeks how we try to transi make a transition. And we are very committed. Amount of money given through the Global Fund project once you leave us in 2017 or maybe 2018, we are ready. We are ready to absorb those kind of activity at our terms. So we are not uh, looking into the amount of money, salary, whatsoever. It's through our terms. We are now looking into the workable approach rather than approach that being tabled out. What we call it is that we want to have a strategic approach with a strategic partner. Now our strategic partner always with non-government organization, even also in the private. So we try to make it such a way that what benefit to the people, the community, should be on the shoulder of the government. It should be, we should be, be a responsible government. It must be adequately address this issue and must assure also the best asset for us is our people. Thank you. So that sounds excellent. Um, and I have to say, I've heard that before from other governments um, and yet the reality is sometimes when it's actually all you, um, there are certain populations, and not, I'm not saying this about Malaysia actually, it's, it's really a question for Marika, uh, which is that we see governments who say they will take on the response, but when it comes to actually paying for certain politically unpopular interventions like needle and syringe programming, or to <coughs> giving money to NGOs rather than to routing it through their own channels, suddenly the commitment uh, turns into something else avoidance and you know I can give examples of many countries I just came from northern Mexico the overall HIV response the government is stepping up on harm reduction which was funded by the global fund those programs basically were radically slashed and never came back and there was no plan and the the, the NGOs <coughs> that were there you know they get donations from from government of some needles but there's no plan and I guess it's a question, as we move toward transition and as we move toward funding allocations that are based on some combination of income level and disease burden, how can we better plan for transition? And I guess maybe what lessons has the Global Fund also been learning, uh, learning as you go? Well, first of all, I wish that all countries were like Malaysia and you could have a serious discussion about transition, but the sad reality is that that's not the case. And also to be very open that the Global Fund doesn't really have a track record on transition so far. We worked before and around the based, uh, based models so countries could submit proposals in, 
and calls for proposals, and all of a sudden countries that realize, oops, uh, we're not eligible anymore, so it would be the cold turkey uh, transition. So um, I totally <coughs> very open about that. We don't have a strong track record on, on transition, and the examples that you gave, like Serbia and Romania, are just expressions of that, because there was never any proper planning. And going forward, and with um, uh, support building on three-year allocations and with the information we have on projection of economic growth, at least we are working now towards transition planning and sustainability, which is a key component, which will be a key component in our next strategy. But that doesn't mean that it still will be easy then, even if you have, and we acknowledge that transition requires time. So Thailand, as Pascal said, had um, it was the Thai government that decided to fund their own programs, which and, and towards ending AIDS in 2030, which obviously we applaud. Um, and we've been working closely with uh, the Thai CCM and the government to work on transition planning, and has been um, money set aside to support civil society to build capacity and very importantly to change legal frameworks because in many countries so government cannot is constitutionally not able to support civil society but it's also clear from Pascal's statements that even if you try the best you can um, that there's concern there's uh, problems that occur on the way and, um, and it also was very clear talking and, and listening to Pascal that we need to engage more closely with civil society in Thailand to really get the full picture. The CSO group that's monitoring transition is currently uh, led by Rakstai, a Thai and, uh, civil society organization. But I think it would be helpful to have a broader engagement with broader civil society in Thailand to really discuss what are the real problems and how can we collectively address them. Because if um, Thailand wants to end AIDS, then uh, people inject drugs and harm reduction programs should be a key element of the response and, and supported by national government. So very committed to work with Pascal and colleagues to, to try to find a solution to this. Um, we have, a, apart from sort of the, the thinking about the transition planning, we have a number of things we're thinking about are already in place to, to help those transitions. Uh, but the first is to work with a number of other organizations on the Equitable Access Initiative where we try to see whether it would be possible to develop a framework uh, to define needs and eligibility that it's more refined than what you currently have in terms of GNI and disease burden because that's quite a blunt tool and doesn't really um, reflect inequality in countries. Um, Another thing is that we have uh, our community rights and gender team led by Kate Thompson, there, Mauro, who's sitting there, also part of. Um, we have special initiative, 15 million over the, the three year current replenishment cycle to support civil society capacity building. And part of it is, is to do advocacy, but also to build the capacity of civil society at country levels to better deliver, better advocate. Um, <coughs> uh, it's another part, we are just start exploring the different models of community-based monitor monitoring as a way to then monitor transition and what's actually happening on the ground, not just the commitments made at the capital level. Um, we have a number of regional programs now in place around people inject drugs and harm reduction. The Eurasian Harm Reduction work, uh, Network was the first one. And um, I'm really excited about the progress that they make because they're advocates, but they also monitor and they publish what governments are funding. And I think this this these uh, examples of, of accountability and just demonstrating what countries actually do are increasingly going to be really important, especially in transition countries. We have another program just approved in Eastern Africa and three in the pipeline for another one for Eastern Europe focusing on cities, uh, West Africa and Asia. So I think those are, again, important components of, of transition and accountability. And lastly, um, Lambert mentioned the Bridge in the Gaps program. I obviously know the Bridging Gaps program very well and we've had discussions with them in the lead up to the current proposal to see how we can also sort of piggyback and link with the, the, the networks that are supported through uh, Bridging the Gaps to see how we can also use that as a, a tool for capacity building and advocacy at country level. Can you imagine any scenario, because for example the EHRN, the Eurasian Harm Reduction Network grant that you mentioned, um, did do excellent work in actually getting governments to also describe their commitment. But in some cases, for example, the Republic of Georgia, the government said yes, and we want to be clear that we mm. intend to commit zero to needle exchange, needle and syringe programming in the coming years. Is there any scenario where the Global Fund could imagine some kind of special channel or a particular intervention or, uh, or way to sustain 
key interventions that you know, whether it's in Thailand or in Georgia, that the government actually does not intend to pick up? Um, I think at the moment the reality is we do pick up a lot of it, but it should be brought up a part of a broader dialogue. I think then the strong point about the Eurasian Harm Reduction Network is that we have it on paper now, zero commitment. Yeah. And that provides a very important advocacy tool. And, and that's going to be part of the discussion with the Georgian government going forward. So how will Global Fund then develop if the government is not going to put in any money for NSP programs, and which is a key program of tackling HIV in, in Georgia and how we can push that. And, and we do have leverage. Uh, because of funding. We also have to be clear that the leverage in some of the Eastern European countries is not that big. We will not be able to totally influence policies, but at least it does help. And we've had, at, at least in some countries, we've seen that uh, through the, 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 the policy dialogue and engagement with national stakeholders and, uh, and civil, civil society, we have been able to push governments to take on more. But this is absolutely a key issue going forward. So, Lambert, you mentioned the importance of advocacy, and I think, you know, for better and worse, it is a common theme that, in my program also, we say, now, we, we usually, we don't support services, but we support advocacy to monitor and press the government for commitments, because that's the, the answer in the longer term. I fear that, as all of us say the same thing, there is actually a funding gap for services, because advocacy is most effective when it's based on genuine services, and indeed, if everyone says, they won't pay for services, it becomes complicated. Like you can advocate and document, but there, meanwhile, much that has been built um, can be lost. I'm curious in, when you think about sustainable transition, um, yeah, how you think about that question and, and touch commitments. Yeah, there's much to be said about that. <clears throat> and of course, we, we, we work very closely together with the Global Fund. We are a sponsor, we are a funder of the Global Fund, so we are having those discussions as well, of course, with the Global Fund. Um, although we have a different position, being a bilateral donor. Let me say, first of all, there's this um, <clears throat> OECD platform in Paris where bilateral donors do together discuss this whole uh, phenomena of how much uh, percent of our, what is the percentage of our ODA which we want to spend on uh, lowest developed, developed countries um, and on, on middle income countries. And um, the, the, the deal is that uh, 0 0.15 um, uh, percent of ODA uh, would now be uh, spent on lowest developing countries and in uh, uh, three years time it will be 0 0.2 percent. So uh, um, one fifth of ODA, that's what we agreed upon in Paris, will be spent on lowest developing countries, which leaves enough room for uh, investments in middle income countries. Um, about speaking about advocacy, maybe one, 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 issue, one more issue which we can do as a bilateral uh, government, uh, and I hope the Malaysian government will join us there, uh, the UNGAS, of course, I mean, it's a completely different level of advocacy, but that will definitely be one of the occasions where, um, where we can raise this issue of the importance of harm reduction. UNGAS will be about much more than harm reduction, but harm reduction maybe will be one of the issues where really there is a, an opportunity, opportunity to to opportunity for change. And it would be excellent if, if not only the Dutch government, but many other governments worldwide could re really raise the point um, and show that maybe harm reduction is not so controversial as some other countries uh, tend to think. I think worldwide, many, many governments are struggling. You know, it, they have harm reduction programs in place. At the same time, there's a lot of criminalization and a lot of uh, uh, very strong law enforcement, which is not very consistent. And I see governments literally struggling with that, with that dilemma because of uh, the simple fact that uh, harm reduction belongs to one ministry and law enforcement belongs to the other ministry. Um, that's a normal thing and, and I think we are all in that, in that transition. It's another transition than the one which you mentioned, but I hope the UNGAS will be a great opportunity for governments to share experiences and maybe for us to also show our Dutch experience uh, where we introduced harm reduction even before the word existed uh, 35 years ago. Um, now, uh, you mentioned uh, Georgia. Um, I was in Tbilisi a couple of um, weeks ago. Uh, and yes, that's typically an example of a country which is, I think, willing to, pick, to, to take responsibility. Countrywide ART coverage. And yes, they are indeed also willing to take responsibility for funding on their side. But what I missed in that discussion uh, was that 
the more contentious um, or more difficult uh, part of government responsibility is dealing with, for instance, uh, anti-stigma or discrimination campaigns or literacy or indeed when it comes to uh, uh, OST or needle exchange programs. That's much more difficult. Well, as a government, we are willing to temporarily compensate, but at the same time, of course, we are not willing to take the role of the one who is funding those programs and service delivery which a local government or in the end the global fund does not want to fund. So we, 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 we are quite uh, consistent with the, uh, the global fund in saying that look, uh, governments, you have to take your own responsibility. What we think might be helpful is when we support um, indeed civil society in playing their role as an uh, advocate and, and as lobbyists at the a, at a national level. And that's a role which maybe is easier for a bilateral donor than for, uh, for instance, the, uh, the Global Fund. Yeah. So, Pascal, you are in a country where, uh, indeed, that kind of assistance is needed. Civil society is advocating and has been advocating, and yet um, they could use some friends. I'm, I'm curious, and, and this, I think this is a very important point, but it's also the policy environment, and Thailand is another place where there's a, a challenging policy environment and where there's law enforcement skeptical about needles and where the government has also said, we don't intend to fund these things. What kind of help could you use from, yeah, from others of us in this room, particularly bilaterals or international donors? That's a very good question. I think that the first thing that needs to happen in Thailand is to clarify the situation in regards to that transition plan. Right now, depending on who you ask, everyone's got a different answer, whether there is a transition plan or even whether the transition is happening or some have even called it a success. A year, 14 months before it was, it's even finished now, people are claiming success in Thailand's transition. Um, that's, Ozone, our organization, has never seen such a plan. There is, to our knowledge, not a single dollar that's been committed to support the actual implementation post 1st January 2017 so that service can, services can continue to be delivered to people in the field. Um, if you follow me just temporarily down a little rabbit hole, when I was the principal recipient at the Global Fund, before we could access a single penny from the Global Fund, we needed to produce an M&E plan, a stock management plan, a financial plan, a data management plan. You know, we, we needed to prepare about 10 to 20 plans and documents to ensure the Global Fund that what we were doing was going to follow the plan. In Thailand, there is no transition plan. The plan is being finalized now when we've, we're already 10 months into that transition. Where I'm from, that's called making it up as you go along, not transition planning. I think that's a key problem. For, the, for these transitions to be successful, the plans need to be in place before the transition starts. There needs to be agreement and consensus, including from civil society groups, on what is going to happen after the Global Fund pulls out. Without that consensus in place, it's kind of irresponsible to let a country like Thailand and expect them that they will miraculously, spontaneously start funding harm reduction nationally. Thank you. In Thailand, the, the transition that's been planned so far has been essentially based on, has been based not on evidence, but on people's feelings, especially in terms of harm reduction. We set up in our project in 2000, 9 to 2014, we collected over 50 data points about each one of our clients, five and a half years of longitudinal data. When the planning for the transition started, not a single entity or organization came to look at our data, which is a big concern considering that essentially we were the repository for data about injecting drug users in Thailand. And no one's bothered to look at that data. Um, the systems that we use to collect data are no longer in place. The data remains, and we, no, we don't have the capacity to analyze that data or to do research with it, nor does any of our partners that are funded through the Global Fund in this particular transition. Uh, one of the things that would be very helpful for us is to have some partners, particularly from academia, to come and help analyze that data and produce some publications or evidence that helps the Thai government make evidence-based decisions. 
Second thing I think where we need a lot of help is uh, under our project, under the previous project, we were able to advocate uh, over the five years and we were successful in getting the National Harm Reduction Policy passed, endorsed by the government in September 2013. It was deployed in October 2014. Unfortunately, because of the transition, advocacy was cut out from our program. We cannot do direct advocacy anymore. And so no advocacy since the beginning of 2015 was done to maintain that policy. In September of this year, the policy expired. There is no more harm reduction policy in Thailand. It has expired. We are back to pre-champion IDU policy levels of support in Thailand, unfortunately. Last thing, I think that what, where we need support is for organizational strengthening and capacity building for ozone. Ozone came out, was registered as a local Thai NGO in December 2014. When that transition was happening, the PR helped negotiate so that Ozone could access some technical support. There was budget allocated under the new funding model for Ozone. About $250,000 apparently that was put in the budget specifically for that. None of that, we, were, we have not been able to access any of that technical support funding to date. We were told that that money has been reprogrammed without, without discussion with us or without consent. And there's been no mechanism to provide any kind of technical support or organizational strengthening for ozone. So for example, Global Fund expects us to manage the money properly. We don't have an accounting software and we don't have money to even purchase an accounting software. We don't have log books to track what services we provide to our clients in the field. Again, that kind of, we, we need support from technical service providers, donors, to come in and help provide the support to ensure that Ozone, which is the organization that delivers about 80% of the volume of harm reduction services to injecting drug users in Thailand, that they need to be supported. Ozone needs some support if we're going to ensure continuity. I think the last key message I want to leave with is that you know, Thailand's transition by some organizations have already called Thailand's transition a success. It seems that they're focusing, those people who are calling Thailand's transition a success, 14 months ahead of the transition even being finished, is kind of irresponsible. And it seems to focus more about on process rather than impact. It's all great, you know, Thailand's aligned, Thailand's made that commitment, but on the ground, services have been scaled down, there's a lot of risks that have not been addressed, and fewer services are reaching the people who are most in need. So in that respect, it's a bit of an illusion and it's a bit contradictory to present Thailand's transition as a success when there's immense challenges that are not even being raised publicly by global fund representatives or even Thai government representatives. It's not a surprise because of the political sensitivity around harm reduction, but we're relying on organizations like Global Fund, which is the, has been the leader funding globally harm reduction programs at national level. We'd expect the same level of leadership and in guiding countries into proper responsible transitions towards national funding. Thank you. I don't know if, uh, if any pressing responses? No, I, I think this just illustrates that transition in reality is a really complex process and Thailand in a way is a bit of a special case because Thailand the government themselves decided they didn't want to access global fund funding anymore so we now have a sort of crash transition planning which is uh, far from ideal and um, I already committed that we'll follow up with the civil society to make sure that there's a broader dialogue with civil society in Thailand to see where we have gaps. The other thing is that we, since Thailand is actually the only country, the, the first country that really transitions in, uh, on a voluntary basis, we have committed to really documenting. And documenting is not that upfront we say this is successful, but we really document what has worked, what hasn't worked, so that we can learn lessons for other countries that will transition. I want to actually pick up on something that Lambert raised in the context of the UNGAS, but it actually has, is linked to something that we heard yesterday about law enforcement spending. I want to bring it connected to the funding question again. Law enforcement spending versus health spending for people who, who use drugs. So, you know, as we struggle for, to maintain or even struggle with reductions in funding, the reality is that in many, many countries, 
there is plenty of money to uh, enforce drug laws, uh, to pursue, you know, we talk about people who inject drugs as a hard to reach population. The police very often have little trouble reaching everyone because they are well resourced to do so. Uh, there's a campaign this week called 10 by 20 to urge governments to commit at least 10% of the amount that they spend on drug enforcement to harm reduction. And the estimate is that if that were to occur, it would cover all the global needs for harm reduction uh, two years over. So uh, I actually wanted to start with uh, Dr. Shari. Um, 10 by 20, what are your feelings? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Um, before I comment on that question, uh, let me try to bring your attention in 2005. When we implement the harm reduction program, we didn't think about laws on implementing that. Keep the law aside. We try to think what works in this country we did not provide and give up with the current law. What we try to do, we try to maneuver whichever we try to do in terms of public health approach in dealing with people who inject. These are health issues. It's not an enforcement issues. These are the people. These are human need attention on us. That's why we try to look at the angle of public health approach. That's why we didn't touch and we didn't discuss on regarding laws whatsoever. You sound like a doctor. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, that's why yeah, we believe that supply reduction, demand reduction, and harm reduction works. And depend on how you try to deal that issue. They must deal that issue as a human issue. All these three must deal it with a human issue. Your supply reduction is a human issue. Demand reduction must be a human issue. And definitely, public issue is a human issue, harm reduction. So in implementing that, how much money needed whatsoever, I think we already start a 10% a few years ago. And we want to improve it further, maybe 20, 30% on the uh, drug issue into the public health issue. And these are the commitment made. And even yesterday, our minister already made a commitment. By 2030 or earlier than that, Malaysia, we can smell ending AIDS, maybe 2021. And the first pillar of the approach is reaching 95% of people who use drugs into 80% for methadone maintenance program and at the same time 15% for needle exchange program. Why? Because we want also to treat these people who are currently on drug, those being impacted on HIV, be covered with the antiretroviral. We are hoping that we are able to reduce transmission of HIV in this country earlier than 2030 through our current approach. That's why to me that the amount of money being invested on the harm reduction, I think it's more than 10% to the law enforcement. And what it is now is, uh, I think, what the current policy is worth already. Thank you. OK. Uh, actually, Lambert, I wonder if I could ask you the same question. I don't know if you know for your own government, but also in what you speak about with others. Yeah, thank you very much. I th it's, it sounds appealing, right, this 10 by 20 campaign. At the same time, being a government myself, uh, I don't know whether it's very realistic. Uh, governments tend to think in terms of separate budgets, and these are two different budgets which you want to combine, which in administrative terms is a bit complicated. Maybe it's more important, I think, to stress the, um, the importance of decriminalization of drug use, which in itself, again, is also a, st a substantial saving on law enforcement. Well, so let's try to rethink uh, harm reduction. Sometimes we tend to to make a clear distinction uh, between prevention and treatment on the one hand and harm reduction on the other hand. Um, uh, it's kind of black and white thing or a clear dichotom uh, dichotomy, which I, which I don't agree with. It's, it, they are complementary to each other, um, where prevention and treatment and harm reduction are in, are in line with each other. Um, so rethinking of harm reduction as part of our total approach uh, should also be uh, probably um, helpful and maybe um, could also be framed from a cost, cost effectiveness perspective. Harm reduction is relatively cheap. I mean, from a government's perspective, that's also attractive and appealing. It's much cheaper. I mean, the, the figures you, you, you mentioned are, are, are clear and convincing. Harm reduction is much cheaper than law enforcement. So. Um, but let's try to not 
um, oppose these two issues too much, especially le leading up to the, to the UNGAS, and see where we can make harm reduction kind of natural, logical uh, part of our overall approach as, uh, uh, as governments. In the Netherlands, we are very much in favor of harm reduction, but uh, we are not in favor of legalizing drugs. So, although drug use is legal. Um, so, uh, what I want to say is maybe we should be careful in too much polarizing these two issues. Thank you. Marika, any, any thoughts? Well, uh, first of all, I think by any definition, the war against drug has been a miserable failure. And, um, and in, in, in the UNGAS on AIDS, since we are not a member state and not a technical organization, we have a bit of a special discussion. But I would just on, on the law enforcement, actually our new senior human rights advisor, whom, whom we poach from OSF, sorry, Daniel, um, he has introduced uh, now for us to, to, to see how we can work more with law enforcement agencies. Because if you work towards decriminalization as your ultimate goal and focus all your energy there, it's going to take forever. And in the meantime, life for people on the ground will not change much. But I think there's a lot of positive evidence of working with law enforcement agencies, working with the police, to at least make sure that they are aware of uh, harm reduction programs and the, the benefits of harm reduction programs and the benefits of an approach that a public health approach in sort of a criminalization approach it has been really helpful so i think they're also sort of coming back to what lambert said on to not really oppose it because i think law enforcement uh, can also be supporting your programs okay i mean i know that pascal actually works uh, one of his incarnations is uh, as deputy director of uh, network law enforcement and hiv network but I'm actually going to ask you to pause because I'm conscious that the audience may have questions and we, we uh, I want to make sure, I promise that we'll give you an opportunity, but uh, can I invite anyone who has questions about anything that we have talked about so far to, I think there are roving microphones um, and if you would uh, indicate, I can't actually see the microphones. Ah, those people in the orange vests apparently. Um, have microphones. So can you raise your hand if you have a question or an intervention? I see three in this sector. Maybe we'll start in this, uh, this section first. And if you could identify yourself uh, for, and also if I could ask you to keep your intervention brief. We'll take a number of them so that we can uh, have time. Yeah, my first question is to Mr. Pascal. Uh, you mentioned about uh, Thailand not being ready for the transition period, correct? So uh, do you think it's fair because we don't have any panelists from Minister of Health? Is there any uh, people representing the Minister of Health of Thailand to say whether they are ready or not? Uh, that you mentioned that they are not ready for the transition period. Thank you. And could we ask you, could you identify yourself? Oh, I'm Dr. Nasir from the Minister of Health, Malaysia. Okay, thank you. My name is Sonal Mehta and I'm from India HIV AIDS Alliance. My question is to the representative of Global Fund. Um, there used to be a reference of people who re need services and it seems more and more there is a dialogue of country in Global Fund. If Thailand is ready to take, if India is ready to take, who is Thailand and who is India? Often it ends up becoming government and I think people who really need services then are left to themselves. And I, I, I just worry is that the gone are the days of human rights and gone are the days of people who require services. And I would want to really listen to the, um, ref, the response of Global Fund representative. And I understand that as a funding mechanism, there is a limitation, but I really want to know that how is Global Fund making sure that when they mean India or Thailand, they mean people. We'll take two more and then we'll uh, turn to the panelists. Good morning, I'm Anna Dovbach from Eurasian Harm Reduction Network. And uh, my question actually to the Global Fund, 
as we as we see uh, from Pascal presentation and from all our experience transition plan as as it is just just a, a document doesn't work and we all suggest to have like the serious attention to the transitioning the same as a governance in the global fund with the all regulation technical support and investment and if that, that's a question of the strategic view. And we all understand that now we, the Global Fund is a process of developing a strategy. And do you have serious understand, like, I, I understand that you, you have this understanding, but um, do you have the serious intention to think over the investment in transitioning? Because the, the regular grants with, with the services, they are not investing in the transitioning processes because it needs to change the governmental systems. Thank you. Thanks, one more uh, there and then we'll turn to the panelists and then we'll come to the, to the next round. Uh, I'm Abu from India. Uh, the question is for Dr. Sari. Uh, I really wanted to appreciate and thanks for his comment that Malaysian government has uh, done a tremendous work by seeing as a human work. They have not seen as a low problem, but they have implemented harm reduction as a human, seen a human side. So I just wanted to know and ask him Hepatitis C is a very high problem in Malaysia. So when the government is going to see it as a human problem, because uh, you said you don't have a guideline and you are not treating any hepatitis C in Malaysia. So when are you going to the Malaysia government is going to see hepatitis C as a human, you know, human side, not as a guideline or whatsoever? Okay, let's stop there. I know I see questions uh, in other parts of the room, but let's at least take this first round. And I, uh, maybe Marika, you, uh, since I think most of the questions went to you, why don't you start? Thank you, and both very good questions and not easy ones. I will try my, to do my very best. Um, so, so the government decides to transition what happens to the people. That is indeed a concern, and. Um, just moving forward, and, uh, and that's maybe, let, let's first start with the question from the Eurasian Harm Reduction Network. Uh, we really see transition planning as a long-term process. It really works, uh, requires working with all stakeholders at country level to work on just defining what this transition looked like. And that requires time. That, that usually that's like the two years that Thailand has given itself is very rushed. It's a very rushed transition. So in most countries, I would assume this would take a longer uh, time. And as I said, as uh, our board is developing our next strategy, sustainability and transition planning will be a key component. Already the, the team dealing with Eastern Europe and Central Asia, with some of these countries, they've started to, to discuss transition planning, what it would look like, and how the Global Fund uh, in these countries is, uh, so we expect the Global Fund initially to pick up all programs, while the Global Fund focusing on key population pro, uh, activities and, uh, and building the conditions for, trans over, uh, for transition, like, for example, establishing legal frameworks that allow government to fund civil society by building capacity of civil society organizations, by establishing systems of community accountability, uh, community monitoring and accountability. So those are the sort of steps, but all these steps will take time. Um, when it comes then to governments like Thailand or India, um, deciding that they will be themselves off global fund funding and want to uh, fund their own um, <clears throat> uh, response. That's basically sort of following a similar process, even though in the case of Thailand, it has been um, a very rushed process. What has happened in the case of Thailand, and by no means I'm claiming that this is successful or it's an ideal recipe, but there was this strong government commitment. There's work is going on a transition plan. And as far as I know, the latest information I got, Pascal, that the plan is still sort of being developed. And part of it because the government under its national health program and insurance, it can cover quite a range of activities, but specifically activities targeting key populations and, and even more spe specifically like NSP and OST programs targeting people who inject drugs are not part of that. And uh, what I understood, uh, but I stand to be corrected, but I can a follow up with the team was that the government was submitting a specific budget to cabinet which would be discussed this month 
with a budget for exactly those activities. And that's something we'll be following closely because what I said before, uh, any transition in Thailand that does not include uh, NSP or OST programs is going to fail and Thailand will not be able to, um, to end AIDS. Um, at the same time, a budget has been set aside in Thailand and I would assume this would be a similar approach to other countries to then support civil society in the transition pro uh, process and also empower civil society to oversee. But also there it becomes clear from Pascal that that process is not fully inclusive and that people who inject drugs do not feel part of that monitoring mechanism. So that's something we have to look at and, and see how we can remedy. Um, for India, we've been discussing uh, the global fund contribution to India as a proportion of the overall health budget in India is very minimal. And so we're discussing with uh, the Indian CCM now how we can be more meaningful and what the added value of the global fund contribution would be. And some of the thinking is that we could focus our uh, funding to some of the poorest and most affected states and now focus specifically in key populations, assuming that the Indian government will take on the overall programming. Um, and, and then over time work with government and, uh, and civil society to see to what extent the Indian government is prepared to take over. But I also, I just don't want to give the impression that these are easy processes. We know there's many cr uh, countries that their political commitment is uh, lacking. Um, we've seen the Russian Federation where the Global Fund approved an exceptional extension to an exceptional pro uh, pr uh, approval of some civil society uh, support for people who inject drugs. Um, it's small, it's less than a drop in the ocean and uh, we have absolutely zero leverage with Russian authorities to change their policies and I'm not very optimistic that that will change. Uh, to the question of uh, fairness and the absence of the Ministry of Health of Thailand, let me just first ask, is there anyone in the room from the Ministry of Health of Thailand who feels able to speak to this question? No, okay, I just wanted to make sure that we gave an opportunity if in case someone was sitting there feeling that. Um, yeah, Pascal, is it fair? <coughs> well, I think the Ministry of Health in Thailand has been involved in this transition and in harm reduction for a long time. So it's not like the Ministry of Health is not involved, not participating or not supportive. The, the Ministry of Health is heavily involved in the CCM and in helping prepare those plans that are the transition plans. The Ministry of Health has engaged and provided some support for harm reduction, again, through channeled through the CCM and through the Global Fund grants. Uh, the Ministry of Health has been involved in deploying and developing the previous national harm reduction policy that expired earlier this last month. Uh, what's, I think the key issue is that the Ministry of Health, I think there's an expectation from civil society that the Ministry of Health will provide more leadership on health-related issues as they affect people who use drugs. As of, this, as of now, the leadership on drug-related issues remains with law enforcement, with drug control, with public security. So I think that's where there's the, the key issue is. And Dr. Shari, yeah. you say you think about uh, dr dr people who inject drugs from the human perspective. What about hepatitis C? Yeah, thank you for the questions. When we draft the policies in harm reduction, we already include that the able, this approach able to reduce blood-borne diseases, including hepatitis C. That's why person who come from methadone program and needle exchange program, part and parcel of the package of services given is screening of hepatitis C. And we shows that the numbers of hepatitis C is still prevalent among people with drug reducing, part of it. And in terms of treatment, I don't know that your concern is treatment. In terms of treatment, this is the first time in the world that even the developed country, rich country, not afford to buy the drugs. So you can imagine the middle income country like Malaysia try also to buy and parcel the drug into our services. It's very difficult. Then I throw back to all of you. It's, it's you, Paul. It's your initiative to assure that the drug is affordable. Single country can't do that way. You all must unite. If the global can unite and pressure the pharmaceutical company to bring down the price, I don't think the government not willing to provide the services. It's on on you. It's not on the government. I wish all of you, I throw back to all of you, to think it for them. It's your role to negotiate and go back to every country, developed country, poor country, middle income country, 
that you know the price of the pharmaceutical company may not you don't bring the price down or everybody won't buy the product why not thank you let me say that uh, there are several sessions on hepatitis C treatment and access and I hope that we can continue this discussion let me also say that many of us had been inspired by the Malaysian government's willingness to press for things like compulsory licenses and that is something that governments do not just civil society and that uh, we will be looking to Malaysia to set the same kind of example for treatment on hepatitis C that you have on harm reduction and not to have a situation where people have to pay $87,000 in a private clinic in Malaysia for treatment. Uh, let me uh, take some more questions. I know that uh, there were some in the center. Could you please uh, raise your hand again if you have questions? I see one here in the front. Uh, there uh, in the back. Yeah. Um, hi, good morning everyone. I'm Kasia Malinowska from Open Society Foundations. This is a question in response to uh, a comment by uh, the Dutch AIDS ambassador, but really a, a question to, to uh, all of the panelists. Uh, in terms of funding properly harm reduction in 2020, um, the goal that HR, uh, Harm Reduction International has set for all of us, uh, I think a very worthy goal. Um, I, I think, I think f I think a discussion which says that we're framing harm reduction versus uh, criminal justice uh, expenditures is, is not a helpful way to think about this. Uh, because if, you, if one looks at the national um, health policies across the world, uh, drugs policies across the world, what you will see now is that there are usually three or four pillars that all governments are committing themselves to. So it's not something that we are bringing to the table as new. Uh, it's, not, it's not about setting one uh, against the other. But I think when, when you look at the budgets, uh, what you will see is that you usually have two or three pillars that are very well funded, and then, and then one toothpick, uh, which is health or, or uh, drug treatment or however we uh, look at uh, health responses to drugs. So I think the ask here is to sort of legitimately follow with budgets commitments that countries have for most part already made uh, and are not living up to. Uh, so I, uh, as I interpret that ask, it's about sort of transparency, it's about following through on commitments that are made at the national level, rather than setting one sort of budget and one ask uh, against the other. And so I think if we can think about going into ANGAS with that framing, which is, you know, live up to whatever you have on paper, um, then I, I think that maybe is slightly less contagious and, and, uh, and more likely to occur. Thank you. Uh, here in the front and then there on the side. This is a question for Lambert, actually. Um, you said that the Dutch government uh, is against legalization. Could you tell me why the most sensible nation on earth is against legalization? <laughs> okay, and, and uh, one more here, and then I want to make sure that panelists have the time to respond. Oh, we'll take two more, and then. We have a slight technical problem. But. Thank you. Uh, Philip from Malaysia. Uh, I'd like uh, to maybe just make a comment and maybe a question to Dr. Shari as well. Uh, with harm reduction, I think a lot of the effort from the Ministry of Health has been on HIV and AIDS. But it's more than HIV and AIDS. Uh, we have patients who are on treatment, get caught by police, put in lockup, no treatment, lose their jobs lose the stability, go back to drugs. <coughs> and I think the drug laws haven't been changed. I mean, there's a lot of maneuvering for HIV AIDS, but what do you do about human rights? What do you do about other things that are also part of harm reduction? Uh, and is funding going to stop 
when we reach zero, you know, with IV drug use and HIV. Thank you. Uh, last question here, and then. Thanks, uh, Daniel. Uh, my name is Rajiv Kafle. I'm from Nepal, and I'm representing uh, the Global Network of People Living with HIV, uh, GNP+. My question is to Marike. Uh, uh, why do we call you Global Fund now uh, when you are not uh, global and you don't fund uh, most, uh, most of the half, of half global? Okay. We have six minutes, um, and actually, maybe I'll start with Lambert. Uh, why don't you support legalization? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I, I agree with you. There's so much money spent on, on law enforcement, and if you look <coughs> at the UNGAS, we will, I think, we will, I don't know yet, but I, I, I think we will clear, uh, globally see two different regional blocks. Uh, Latin America, at the moment, very vocal, uh, and uh, Europe. On, um, on reducing spending on, on, uh, on law enforcement and at least, at least uh, emphasizing the importance of harm reduction programs, whether, whereas other uh, regions in the world uh, are still very much focused on, uh, on, uh, on law enforcement. I think it would be helpful to, to have a discussion on criminalization versus decriminalization. Decriminalization in the Netherlands and in many other countries does not lead to higher consumption levels. Let's think about that. So what is the, the value of decriminalization? It does pay off decriminalization. It's an economic argument, but of course much more important is also a health argument. In our system in the Netherlands, we have less uh, uh, mortality, less overdoses. Uh, uh, people are more healthy and people, um, um, I mean the impact on society of people who inject drugs is uh, uh, much less uh, visible uh, than in other countries without harm reduction programs. Um, let's have a discussion about that. And so I, I don't only want to have a discussion uh, about, um, about uh, law enforcement and its costs, but also a, a discussion about um, the, the effect of criminalization uh, on society in terms of costs. Now, um, Drugs in, in the Netherlands are illegal, um, but prosecution in the Netherlands is only limited to, uh, to dealing and to production. So drug use in the Netherlands uh, is not illegal. Uh, this is a clear distinction we make, and it's not always easy to, to explain, uh, you know, maybe the, the difference we, have, uh, we make uh, uh, between hard drugs and soft drugs, uh, where uh, on soft drugs, uh, actually, it's easy. You can uh, legally uh, buy a, a limited amount of soft drugs and, and, and use it. Uh, possession uh, is, is not legal, but it's a bit complicated. But, uh, so there's a, there's a way we have managed to, uh, to, to deal with it. Uh, the Amsterdam coffee shops, where you don't buy coffee, but where you can buy cannabis, um, are, of course, a well-known example of our pragmatic approach to this uh, from a health perspective. From a health perspective, and yet we, we started with our harm reduction programs because of hepatitis C in the early 80s. B, you know, sorry, B in the early uh, uh, 80s, um, and actually we even started with methadone programs already in the 70s. And I have to be honest, we were not very successful with that. So it took us 35 years to uh, have working, fully working harm reduction uh, programs. Uh, we were criticized by many countries. Uh, and yes, we, we did fail uh, in, the, in, in the beginning because we didn't get ourselves well organized. There are so many different uh, government and non-government agencies involved. And it really takes time it took time for us to get everyone on board. And a very basic lesson learned for us is that harm reduction is a bottom-up approach. As a government, we are not very good at introducing innovative uh, harm reduction uh, responses. No, it's up to, to people. It's a people-centered approach. It's a human rights approach. And it took, took us while, a while as a government as well to understand that and to apply that into our own policies. Thank you. So, Marika. Why do you call yourself the Global Fund if you're not global and you don't fund? Uh, yeah, no, 
great question. And but, but first to, to support Lambert and uh, on, on drug criminalizing drugs. I think also in the Netherlands what we saw that um, if you want to do that, it should be more like a global effort. It's really difficult for one country to decriminalize drugs if all the countries in the neighborhood do not do that. And the Netherlands was, at least when I was in uh, Lambert's shoes, we always got burned down by this, what's his name of this horrible narcotic board organization in Vienna that's basing its work on the f an agreement from the 50s and still thinks it's relevant. Um, and so it's, I'm not a diplomat anymore, so I can say these things now. And, um, and so it's really difficult. Uh, I think if, if you read all the sort of the, the, the former heads of state who now are in the commission, commission on Drugs or whatever it's called, and now come up with really wise advice that drugs should be decriminalized because most of the problems related to drugs are part, are results of the criminalization. Um, but that should be done on a global scale, and, and I would hope we would get there, but not very optimistic. Then the Global Fund, why we do call ourselves a Global Fund? Well, we're pretty global still. Uh, we support programs in 120 countries, and if you would add the, the countries that are not directly eligible, but part of some sort of uh, regional effort, it's up to 140, so that's quite a lot. We support countries, so the, the countries that can apply for support for the Global Fund are all those that are low income, low middle income, and for those upper middle income countries with high disease burden, which in the case of uh, concentrated epidemics means that there is um, prevalence of over 5% in any one of the key populations, so that's still pretty wide. Um, and to be very clear, and I know there's always lots of rumors going on, the Global Fund will not pull out of middle income countries. Uh, what is a fact is as countries move into high income status and we know, know with the level of economic growth in big parts of the world, there will be a number of countries that are currently receiving funding from the Global Fund will move into high income status. Um, that's quite a clear cut off point because if you would start supporting programs in uh, high income countries, um, we definitely be more global. We do also have to start moving some of these programs in state of the United States that have really crappy policies on people who inject drugs, so I don't think that would be the best use of money. Um, it's also very clear that domestic funding needs to go, uh, go up, and especially in countries at higher income level. It's really no excuse for countries that uh, have the money but you refuse to spend the money to do that, so we should push collectively pressure on those countries. And um, also, um, in the current situation, um, the, the, the sort of what, what we call in Global Fund terminology banned for countries which are the, the, the countries that at higher income level with low disease burden have been protected. So it is of the global disease burden like 2.3% and they receive close to 7% of the funding. That is likely to change even though the global government, the, the, the board is discussing that. But it also was based on some sort of a false assumption that key population issues and human rights issues are concentrated in upper middle income countries. They think as we have better data and as we are more aware of these issues, key population issues and human rights violations occur all over the world, whether it's upper middle income and low income countries. So there's really not a strong justification to protect the upper middle income country group because of that argument. Uh, so much more to discuss on that because of course we are particularly per focused on people who, in, who use drugs and, of, and also that disease burden is not the only gauge of need because there's prevention need also. But we'll save that for another time. Pascal, uh, very quick comment from you on this the law enforcement versus harm reduction, must we choose? And then last, I'll give the last word to Dr. Shari. I'll just talk briefly about my experience in Thailand under the Champion IDU project. Um, the context in Thailand, obviously, war on drugs ra were raging for more than 10 years now. Uh, our staff, our work, project workers were regularly arrested, 2 to 12 per month over a 66-month period. So our entire workforce was essentially arrested at least twice. Uh, we had to hire, we hired a senior Thai police officer who I believe is actually in this room. Uh, it was Dr. Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kisanapong Putakul. He's here in the room, I believe. 
and he was instrumental, that partnership of hiring a senior Thai police officer to work with us and advocate when there were issues in the field, to work with us and advocate directly to his peers as police officers and explain why our project was operating, how it was operating, what support we needed, was very effective in reducing some of the negative consequences of engaging with law enforcement. Unfortunately, in the transition, those, that component was cut. Uh, it was even described by a senior global fund official as ancillary, a secondary, not very useful mechanism for us, and that we should concentrate on meeting our targets. Uh, in that context, you know, I think our law enforcement approach was very successful. We documented it. I think you can, some of you might have seen this report online. Otherwise, there might be some copies still at the booth, and I suggest you pick one up. But my also colleague, Kunoy, who's sitting in the front, Kun Virapan, will be presenting in the next session about the successes of our project, including perhaps some of the lessons learned from engagement with law enforcement. So that's a good transition to the question to Dr. Shari. It's not just about HIV targets. It's about bigger picture, and are you missing it? Okay, before that, I'll ask, I need to answer the question by Philips. Um, on the harm reduction, so for information that we have uh, police officers in various levels of task force at the national level, provincial level, and district level. And for information also, part and parcel to be, to be a uh, police officer, you must pass exam, and part of the exam is on harm reduction. And the police department made a module on harm reduction to train their people. Means that they try to assure that their people did understand on harm reduction. And for your information, anybody or the people who use drug when they join the harm reduction program, this is not the license to get the immunity. No. If you do it, uh, something wrong, so they will catch you because uh, police officers have to admit that anybody make a complaint or report to the police department for the misbehavior or whatsoever, they must act action on that. Mm -hmm. and for information, once the people who are on harm reduction and being kept by the police and put in lockup, our officers and even the outreach officers will go to the police officer, what's wrong with the person here? And to reduce that kind of phenomena, yesterday we discovered the deputy director general, anybody on harm reduction program or the needle exchange program or methadone program, will we give them a special card. Currently, for the needle exchange program, you go to the my officers here, there's a barcode there. Khalid, ada nampak barcode? Ah, there's a barcode. So we can now detect who are these people on needle exchange program. Later on, we try to extend to the methadone, methadone program because this is the way that we try to inform the public that these people are on recovery process. These are the people on the healthcare management. And for your information, being uh, recognized by the government, the harm reduction program able to reduce crime in this country. We have Dr. Roshidi part and members of the uh, National Lab on Crime Reduction. It being recognized that harm reduction is part and parcel of the process in reducing crime. And I urge other countries, you are not doing so, if the crime is there, please join us in harm reduction program. And, and furthermore, I wish, I wish everybody that this is the cheapest model, the cheapest investment, but give a maximum impact for those people, among people who use that. Thank you. So, m many of the themes that we have talked about will be touched on elsewhere in the conference. I also want to commend to people's attention StopTheHarm.org, which is a collective platform that's building toward the UNGAS that talks about harm reduction, funding, also about drug policy, regulation, etc. And I hope you will join me all in thanking our panelists, um, both for your willingness to support harm reduction and to take the hard questions about it. Thank you.